Radio. Some of the states have already legalized and it's working. Providing a fresh perspective on the events shaping the cannabis industry. With your host, Deputy Chief of Rock Normal, Steve Vanderwall. From business and politics to medicine and technology, and everything in between, this is Rock Normal Radio. What is up, everybody? Happy Monday. Good to be here in studio again. And believe it or not, I love Mondays because it's podcast day. And every time we record an episode of Rock Normal Radio, I get an opportunity to talk to somebody much smarter than me. And today that's going to happen. Uh, my guest today is Zach Sarkis. And Zach Sarkis is the founder and executive director of New York Hemp Lab a 501c3 not-for-profit here right in Rochester, New York. Its mission, to serve as an in industry incubator, supporting economic growth and community development through a variety of educational events and services. Last November, Zach hosted the first Hemp Lab event, a full-day symposium on all things hemp at the Wegman School of Pharmacy at St. John Fisher College. The success of that event led Zach and his team to work with the Greater Rochester Chamber of Commerce to co-host another great seminar called Canna Business, capitalizing on the cannabis economy, of capitalizing on the cannabis economy, a half-day conference on the challenges and opportunities of the emerging cannabis industry. This 400-person sold-out event brought together four powerful panels to discuss topics of medicine and science, industry, compliance and law, and social justice. And it is with great pleasure to introduce someone who is a thought leader in the industry and someone who will undoubtedly leave a profound positive impact on the future of cannabis legalization in New York. And I know that because he's already doing it. Ladies and gentlemen, my good friend, Zach Sarkis, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you, Steve. I'm glad that we uh, avoided that pre-show meltdown in the parking lot. We're all right. Thank yeah, you, we're... Tiva Brands, yeah, for yeah. helping uh, calm my nerves. Yeah, shameless plug. <laughs> Uh, so you've been in the cannabis industry a lot longer than I have and a lot longer than most people that, you know, we fraternize in, in this industry. How did you get started? Oh, that's funny. Um, being, you know, it depends on how you define the industry. To some, I could say I've been in the industry for 15 years if I play at the idea of being a consumer, you know, in upstate New York. And that doesn't necessarily mean a good thing given the, what consumer products have looked like for the past 15 years getting to the... <laughs> getting to a better place at this point in time. Um, yeah, my first like dive into the industry, um, I was invited to work on a medical cannabis farm out in California sometime, uh, let's say 2013. Um, actually, it was 2012. And yeah, that was my first really dive into the industry itself. Um, lived on a farm where they're cultivating expert grower um and i was just labor you know working in the, working in the garden and um definitely kind of rough around the edges but an incredible experience and that led to uh yeah working more of the processing the trimming i've done a couple of seasons of that work uh and yeah that was kind of the starting point i've, I've met the right person who invited me to work on their farm because there's we know that the cannabis industry is very much industrious yeah. you know it takes a lot of labor a lot of work especially if you're doing it right and uh, so that was my, my entry point, grunt labor. Grunt labor. I feel like every the, all of us have kind of started in, you know, whether it's the, you know, growing side of the things or the, the, the gray side of the, uh, you know, the industry and more of an illicit market. We all kind of have our story. What were you living in California at the time? What brought you to California? No, actually being kind of a frugal backpacker, I saw it as an opportunity to fund my travels. And I, um, you know, I left in fall after working, you know, full on summer with some money in my pocket and went out there and funded my travels through the work I did. I worked on a bunch of different farms really, but spent a longer term on uh, the first farm I was mentioning. But you can kind of, at the time you could go network and find a place to work and make the next paycheck, yeah. work a week, travel. Um, but essentially, yeah, that, that trim money got me through the winter. Yeah, something's got it. Yeah. My question is, how do you go from, you know, labor serving, you know, multiple different as, you know, aspects of the industry from the farming side to the growing and trimming to creating this vision for New York Hemp Lab, mm -hmm. which is which is this really this grandiose 30,000 foot view of what I believe is, is exactly how an incubator should be set up and how mm -hmm. exactly what this industry needs. How does where did the vision for New York Hemp Lab come from? 
Yeah, that's a great question. And, you know, I like to joke that my senior year of high school, I gave a speech on the utilitarian value of hemp for my senior speech. And my senior year of university, I met one of the world-renowned experts in industrial hemp. That's just kind of this theme that's been part of my life. And, um, yeah, I happened to find myself working on the West Coast in the, like, through 2016 to 2018 in the cannabis industry, which was quite unexpected, but lucky to have had that and really saw the extreme economic and social impact in a very impoverished rural area in California and how it galvanized the community, how young people moved back, how restaurants were popping up. Uh, Again, how many people were employed. Um, I was blown away. And I also saw I watched, you know, the market drop out. I watched the price point of a pound go from 1600 to a, to to 1000 to you know wholesale 250 bucks a pound and just watching how that devastated communities and seeing how you know big money making big moves seeing technological innovations coming out of the bay think all these things that you know really opened my eyes to like what this industry was and the magnitude um and so from that I I have this mind that's uh, kind of tailored towards being efficient. You know, like how can I save a couple seconds here that adds up to an hour over the course of the week? Um, and that led me into, yeah, contact with a great group that I had been working with out in California, thinking I was going to move to Berkeley, working on a project specifically connecting cultivation to technology to consumer. Um, and yeah, long story short, that didn't happen. I landed back in New York. And really seeing this as fertile grounds as a place where, like, people, one, don't even know the industry is here. Like, we put on the hemp lab last year, and it was kind of like out of this desperation. Like, are we really not, as a community, talking about hemp that's going to be passed federally legal? Like, it's going to be federally legal this year, and there's not a formal conversation happening in upstate New York or western New York. Um, So, yeah, coming from this understanding of, like, the broad use applications of hemp, um, knowing the federal farm bill was going to be passed, and... Uh, when I'd left New York, you couldn't touch, you know, hemp with a stick, a 10-foot stick. You, it was really like some of the first folks who were cultivating in New York State had to do so under armed guard, you know, just because of how scared everybody was. And now as we see that weaning off and it's like, oh, yeah, no, this is a food. This is a medicine, a wellness product, you know, has bioremediation capacity. Like there's a plethora of things that it's being used for that I think just starting with education, like, folks, we need to look at this. Um and looking beyond that, it's like not only looking at communities who need to be educated, not only looking at um, like engaging universities, but really like what it takes to actually build a business and support this, again, an industry that's in its infancy. It's, uh, it's so much more than anyone can fathom. And the fact that people don't know what hemp is 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 that that's our like that's our baseline like wow how are we going to launch a successful industry in Rochester that can compete with the multinationals that are in 13 countries growing cannabis you know that are coming to put you know big facilities in our region and um so it's really coming from seeing the opportunities seeing the impact of a flooding market or an unsupported small you know medium scale businesses that just don't have the infrastructure or the resources to to compete um and seeing the lack of knowledge that is like well it's clear that creating a place that can engage and support a community or an industry is is a really solid standing starting point, especially when there's a lot of movement in in an emerging market. Yeah, it's funny. We, you know, just like you, I'm, you know, we're all kind of surrounded by all things cannabis, from politics to science and medicine and everything in between. And I'm always assuming that everybody's on the same page, or I'm always behind. Mm. And I actually had a lunch meeting this morning with a very educated, very successful man who is, has been in food and processing and, and in some some serious industries over the last three decades. And I, you know, we were talking about hemp and cannabis, and he goes, "Wait a second, what's the difference between hemp and cannabis?" And I'm thinking. Oh my God. Oh boy, here we go. You know, and you assume that everybody has this level of education. Mm -hmm. So for us, you know, as Rock Normal, where we can really have aligned with New York Hemp Lab is we have to provide a platform for education. And it's like one entity cannot possibly provide all of that. You Mm -hmm. know, even if you have a full team, paid team, Mm -hmm. you know, we're all volunteers. We're all in startup mode. So it's like being able to have these multiple, you know, educational focus entities right here in Rochester has undoubtedly been why we've been able to leave such a mark but Mm. what when you guys threw you know the cannabis symposium that was 
held a couple of weeks ago was remarkably successful. Mm. 400 people sold out at the Hyatt. I mean, this was a remarkable event with some serious players in the game. Why was it so important to have that event at the time that it was, mm. or at the time that you did? It's the same thing with the Hemp Lab. It's like, this is coming. And it's going to take a community and a diverse group of people to actually discuss the complexity and the opportunity to hand. And from the onset, I'd really seen this. We need to have you know, four key panels that are looking from both sides of what's here, you know, from legislation to health and medicine to law enforcement, social justice and the innovative, you know, the business and innovation. It's it's extensive, the, the field at hand, let alone we're not talking teaching 101. We're talking 001, like intro class. And we knew that organizing the chamber and myself, again, like shout out to Bob Duffy, Susan George, like incredible yeah. opportunity to work with them. Um, but we knew it was going to be a jam-packed event that's going to hopefully bring people from zero to at least, you know, conversational. Like, okay, this is a big thing that we all really need to be talking about to ensure that it's rolled out in a good way. Um, and it really relates back to the efforts that, like, we've seen from Rock Normal. It's like you guys have been going down to to Albany regularly to push and advocate for something that actually is functional and presentable and for the people as well as for business. Um, and it's like without efforts on both sides of the advocacy as well as the community engagement, it's like we're all playing the cards that we have and whatever we can do to leverage to engage more people and to educate as foundational, um, the, then we're all moving in the same direction. So, yeah, it's really this just like we need to talk about this and we need to talk about it now and we need it to look broad enough that people aren't just thinking pot stocks, you know, are growing. Know. Yeah. It's like the name of the game is mass education is to be able to hit as many people with facts and truth and like really science as possible. And historically it's like, how many people can we get into one room at one time? Not enough. Not enough. <laughs> now it's how many influential people can we get in the room at one time mm -hmm. on one day? And how many people can we reach on a digital platform? You know, being able to leverage things yeah, like absolutely. social media and email addresses. And I think that, you know, with a relatively small, un you know, no lack of funded team, you can make some profound impacts on this industry, which is, you know, we're getting heavily lobbied against by, you know, organizations like Sam, who is heavily funded. And mm. it's just like you you bring together people that have passion and bring together, you know, the, these different ec areas of expertise coupled with some serious, you know, modern age, you know, digital strategy and just communication strategy. And before you know it, you're moving freaking mountains. And it's, it's you know, Rochester is positioned very uniquely. We have some really powerful human resources and entities that have uh, kind of collaborated. But I think, you know, as states start to legalize the, the look to our city, and be like, what did they do? Mm. How, how are they able to make such 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 progress with, you know, you know, just these couple of relatively startup entities? So my hat is off to you. Mm. I, uh, you had said something earlier um, in regards to usages for hemp. You know, we always talk about CBD as the bud word, right? You know, mm -hmm. I'm in the CBD industry, everybody and their brothers in the CBD industry. What we you said um, is bioremediation mm -hmm. and the, the plethora of uses that hemp seems to bring things from hempcrete to grain and animal feed to all these different things. Can you elaborate a little bit on bioremediation? Yeah. And I'm glad you didn't ask me to elaborate on all the other stuff because we could talk forever. <laughs> yeah. um, bioremediation is the ability of plants. It's technically phytoremediation of you know these leafy plants to draw up and out of the soil. In this case, remediating heavy toxins, heavy metals. Um, don't ask me to list what metals under what conditions because it's that research is still being driven. But it's proven that this is a plant that can help heal soils, help create you know break up clay soils doesn't mean it likes clay but it can have an impact as well as draw up um some of these heavy metals that are polluting whether it's uh yeah brown fields traditional or you know something that's got pesticides in it which is something to be concerned about you know we're talking about yeah big cbd industry well were there pesticides on that field that has grown on this year or the year before? And is that something that's drawn up into the plant? And does it go into the big leaves, like the heavy metals? Does it go into the bud? Does it go into the seed? Those are questions we need to do more research on. But we know that this plant can suck stuff up and actually suck stuff out. Um, it's really one of the most beautiful things about hemp is its capacity to sequester carbon. So draw carbon out of the sky and lock it either in its roots, in the soil, or in its, uh, its fiber. And so when we talk about hempcrete, it's incredible building material, renewable resource. Um, one of the greatest things that it's doing is actually again, drawing carbon out of the sky, which we know we got enough up there. It's, it's, there's too much carbon in the water and there's too much carbon in the sky, not enough carbon in the soil. And that's one of those things that 
This plant can sequester carbon in the soil as well as lock it into its fibers that when used downstream, um, really, it's like, you know, everyone's talking about uh, like what's the best way to mitigate, quote, climate change or regardless of whatever you think about it, just the fact there's too much carbon in the air and it has an impact on how things move. Um, you know, one acre of hemp is said to sequester, to draw down as much carbon as an acre of trees does in 25 years in one season. And it's like, that's incredible. It's like, so as we can begin to see this, like, uh, there's a lot of conversation about carbon mitigation, sequestration, reduction, and I think hemp will play, be a big role. So drawing heavy metals out of soil, but also drawing carbon out of the sky. And that's, that's a pretty awesome thing. I don't even know how to, I can't even begin to wrap my head around that because it's like, it doesn't get rid of the carbon. It just puts it in all the right place. Locks it up. Yeah. And so predominant, it's like the cellulose content of, of hemp is astronomical. You know, it's like over 60% and it's like, that's, that's carbon. You know, the amount, um, I think we'll see more and more studies that's actually showing how much is locked into the soil. Um, but essentially anything that's an, that's organic is carbon you know, uh, soil is carbon. And so if this is something that can help build soil, then it's helping, you know, by implementing carbon and as well as facilitating microbial life, you know, there's, there's a lot to be said there, but yeah, most, the direct correlation is like, if we're building with this hemp herd, the inside of like the woody material of, of the hemp plant, like that's like mostly carbon and that gets used if it's an animal bedding, um, you know, it'll be used in the short term, but then it'll be composted and put back in the soil. If it's used for hempcrete, it could last a lifetime just in between these walls right here. Um, you know, storing something that is again, currently overpopulating the skies. Hempcrete's pretty strong, right? It's, is it, it mirrors concrete to some extent, doesn't so it? So it's uh, currently the predominant form of hempcrete is non-structural. So they're using it more for insulation. You know, the R value is quite high. It's substantial. It's something that with thick enough walls, you know, and not ridiculously thick, like you could totally insulate your house on this um, in upstate New York. Um, my buddy, big shout out to Maddie Mead of Hempitecture. These guys are leading educators, engagers, and driving force of like how to innovate using this thing. And it starts with the fact they're going around and pushing for building code adjustments. So, like we can't build with this thing that's flame retardant, that's, you know, antifungal, antibacterial. It's like that's back to zero, zero, 001 class. It's like here's something we can use that's not poison that we're putting in our walls that you could actually pull out and throw into compost later on down the road. Um so yeah, it's, uh, it's the predominant use is being sh is for shaping for walls for insulation, um, but there are some cool innovations of uh, specifically out of Canada of actually putting it into br brick format. So actually using it to stack and be weight bearing, but that's not it's not uh, widespread yet. I mean, I assuming that I mean with the ability how you know the capacity for us to grow hemp across the country and what it could do for like people that don't have housing or third world countries where there's no housing is is game is a game changer yeah it's a one world solution you know it's, it's like this is something that could be grown on any continent um and really with the right infrastructure and support like yeah housing shouldn't be an issue it is it is a renewable resource that uh of course you've got to treat the land correct to the degree of like you know, word of rule of thumb is you don't want to plant consecutive years hemp hemp crop in the same in the same land without adding nutrients back because it draws out a lot a lot of nitrogen, for example. And it's oh, so it just it has to be it's still strategic land use associated with this planting, and that's where like you know thank God we have Cornell Cooperative Extension universities who are looking into best management practices. Um, and really, as we move more towards a there's this conversation on regenerative agriculture. Like what practices actually build soil? What actually, what practices build ecology and the, the ecosystem that creates a healthy, uh, yeah, soil system that can retain more water, that can grow better plants. And so it plays in this, we're in this interesting time where like new plant, old plant, new farming practices, old farming practices. Um, and really just the folks who are looking for more sustainable based agriculture. I think there's, there's a lot of, opportunity with this plant that does a lot to the soil but again we can't just expect it to heal the soil by planting it again and again so it's all it's all about strategy so would you go from like you know a hemp crop and then the next year would be a corn crop or a soybean crop or whatever it is and back to hemp is it like a one year on one year off yeah, type of thing exactly and i mean to be determined what crop and that, that actually talks about scale and magnitude like where is the industry going it's like um 
that's when you got to really think strategy and when it becomes a commodity, especially for grain and fiber, um, more specifically grain, like as an alternative commodity to soy, to corn, um, doing it like they've been doing it for the past generations um, isn't necessarily good practices. That's not a, that's not a, a slap to anyone who's cultivating or farmers, just more like, you know, the, the green revolution was based off fertilizers and large scale, you know, production. And that's done a number on our soil quality and, the, the top soil, like our life, our life is dependent on the, the, the eight inches or 16 inches of soil that we're farming out of that's being depleted by, you know, old school practices. So, um, yeah. And that's where it comes the fear of allowing, you know, vertical, vertical integration in these big companies to come in because inevitably when you're looking to scale a business like agriculture, you're going to start not, you're going to not use best practices. And mm. this is a plant that needs to have TLC from seed to sale or soil to oil, which mm. I heard the other day. <laughs> nice. um, but it seems like hemp has the potential to be a, a solution to many problems that, you know, we're facing in terms of bioremediation. Mm. It's, it's plentiful in CBD. It has strong medicinal value and it also has strong nutritional value. It's what mm. people would call a super food what is it about hemp that makes it a superfood oh man this is a seed that's you know you can get a ton per acre on a good harvest and that ton per acre we're talking about a seed that's 30 percent protein 30 percent omega threes and sixes you know in, in the optimal ratio um and a bunch of fiber like it's just it's a it, superfood whatever you want to call it it's just it's a super high protein um and in a day and age where like yeah reconsidering how much how we consume our protein is it plant-based is it animal-based um and again thinking commodity crop like people are growing corn and soy on like hundreds of acre size um, and that stuff's mostly for feeding our food versus here's a plant that we can grow that could actually like replace cereals you know imagine a 30 percent protein cereal that like they, you know you can't. <laughs> exactly and so um yeah back to the concept of the vertical integration I, that's it's kind of it's just crazy. You know, there's going to be big business. It's going to be big scale. When we're talking farming, like, you know, I don't know if the, te the appropriate term is even vertically integrated or not, but the fact of the matter is that there's going to be large volume production. And for grain, it's it's going to be introduced into this commodity crop rotation um, that's, yeah, bigger agriculture. And I think that's really is a as a region, as a country, as a world, like re re we're at this point where we need to think about how we're doing this and what's going to serve future generations. But fact being that this is something that is going to impact our diet and people don't even know about it yet. It's like, wait till you start seeing like, you know, billboards, like eat local. And it's just like, you know, hemp seed oil yeah. or like a, you know, the, the hemp protein that's we're currently shipping from Canada, you know? It's there's definitely two industry two sub industries within the hemp industry and that's in the consumables and non consumables. Mm -hmm. Anytime you talk about consumables and mm -hmm. putting stuff in your body, you have to f know exactly what's going in, exactly the process in from mm -hmm. seed to sale, which is something that big big ag is t doesn't tend to to adhere to. Is mm -hmm. you know as a locally sourced, you know that you know we want our food to be locally sourced, close to home, you know see, food from farm to table, mm -hmm. and that tend you know big agriculture that tends to, to stray away from that. But I do think that there is a place for big agriculture in the non-consumable industry, especially when we bring up the conversation of hempcrete and being able to essentially create carbon farms, right? Mm. Being able to plant mass amounts of, of cannabis and, you know, dense locations to essentially extract the carbon out of the air and put it into the soil. Um, how has, you know, I think the hemp game is really kind of picking up in the Western New York area and Western, you know, in, in the Rochester region. How has New York Hemp Lab started to work with the local entities, if at all? And what is what is your guys' moves going forward? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, yeah, and there's definitely subcategories and like FDA is going to have its opinion about everything, which is happening right now, whether that's the hemp food or how we can consume CBD. Um but yeah, Hemp Lab right now, it's been engaging. I think a lot of what we're trying to do now is like ask the right questions, um, speaking with stakeholders and understanding what are the problems you're facing and beginning to shape and understand how we can either put on events or seminars or um, identifying these key pain points for the industry. Um, and, you know, there's I could be making phone calls all day and I wouldn't be able to get through the list of folks who are participating in the industry in New York State right now. But that's really the short term positioning of 
uh, understanding what's at hand and what people are actually interested in and need um, because it's be easy to run and say, we got the answer. We're going to do this for you guys. But, uh, you know, the more I learn about how business functions, really designing a solution to address a problem. So we're really in this kind of problem searching phase um, and knowing that foundationally education is there's optimal. It's just going to be continuous. But what's strategic for stakeholders, what's strategic for the public, what's strategic for municipalities and law enforcement each category of individuals who are in this industry will have specifics that they need. So really trying to flesh out what's the best way to inquire, what's the best way to then turn that into something that's resourceful for, for individuals and, and businesses. And keeping it within the community. <clears throat> I mean, it's, there's so, you know, I always, you know, bring up the, the supply chain, you know, and all the variables that go into a strong supply chain. And when we look just at like a micro level, just in the, the agriculture and horticulture side of, side of things, there's still multiple verticals within there that's, you know, bound to c- create these little thriving micro industries. You know, I had recently been learning about, about soil and the, the, the notion of red jiggler worm dirt, mm-hmm. right? Like, um, Red it, Jiggler, Red Wiggler. Red Wigglers. <laughs> Can I get some Red Wigglers? Better, and it's like, so, it's, yeah. it's, it's kind of funny to think about, but it's like, that's going to be an industry. Like dirt is, people are going to make money on dirt no and doubt. people are going to make money on seeds. And there's just like all of these separate sub, sub industries that, you know, we're looking at this as like, you know, we're starting, just starting to get past the idea that there's other things besides cannabis that get you high. And Hey, there's like this huge monstrosity of an industry with all these micro industries that if we do right we could see economic and agricultural and and scientific advances and innovations like we've never seen before Mm -hmm. the problem is is getting that over the finish line totally and engaging the right people in the right time and it's timing's everything especially right now we're like we're kind of sitting waiting back like okay are we going to open cannabis up right now big picture you know all things cannabis you know that includes hemp that's medical marijuana that's recreational cannabis um but the longer we wait you know, the more international or national players begin to position themselves, claim market share, gather resources. Like there's just so much money pooling and piling and devouring the market everywhere but right here. And we're kind of like, oh, weed's coming. But it's like, no, there's like a, a massive industry forming and shaping and moving hard. And so how to engage the community so we can help drive that leadership, drive that innovation across like the multitude of fronts that Rochester's positioned to do so. And you addressed a couple of those, you know, it's like, we're an agricultural center of the world. I don't care what anyone's saying. The world in one way, shape or form is looking to the Finger Lakes region. What are they doing? It's, we got the water, we got the land and we have the, uh, even like the agro ecological tourism thing going on. It's going to continue to thrive if, if well played, um, technology, you know, it's like RIT, like they got scouts from Facebook and Google just sitting there getting kids when they're sophomores. It's like, there's a lot of solutions that, um, you know, one thing I'd like to say is like hemp and cannabis is a doorway into the ag- world of ag tech. It's like, this is a doorway into so many things, but specifically ag tech and the amount of solutions of, you know, making, bringing efficiencies to small, medium scale farmers or large farmers, but like through the use of technology and beginning to engage, uh, the tech minded folks like, yeah, how do we help do automation in greenhouses? How do we help small farmers oversee and do cost mitigation or re- reduction of vulnerability, uh, or, or find, yeah, support them with better, more uh, active planning tools. Like it's extensive how we can begin to bring technology in there or supply chain, you know, track and trace, traceability, all these things that we know tech are, are tech central. Um, but if we're not talking about it as a community, we're not engaging this like rich resource, let alone like, you know, the medical. You had Dr. Harold on here, Dr. Harold Smith of Canometrics and Oyogen. Um, you know, he can't talk about cannabis in his school, you know, you can't talk about the endocannabinoid system, a system in our bodies that interfaces with phytocannabinoids. We have endocannabinoids that are made inside us. We can't talk about these in universities because they're scared of getting federal funding taken away on the side. You know, the government allows for cannabis research to happen down in Mississippi, like on, at the University of Mississippi. It's like, it's like a warehouse full of ditch weed. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's just it's remarkable. Um, you know, this is an innovative hub. Rochester always has been and will be, but if we're not engaging back to like, why, why hemp lab, why can business, if we're not gathering today and talking about the opportunity, then 
the big players are going to push us out and come claim their market share here in our town. And I think that's we got enough innovative spirit to develop solutions, develop brands, develop uh, pathways into success and innovation that uh, is right here. So that's a big, a big thing. Yeah, we're poised to be the next great city. You know, uh, it was not John Gruber. He's a Ford economics professor out of MIT. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was called Jump Starting America. I don't remember the title, but it's got like two jumper cables on you know mm -hmm. the United States. And essentially, what he did was he did this uh, hundred city study where he looked at a hundred smaller big cities, so not New York, not Philly, not Boston, and ran them against a, a bunch of parameters, things like average commute time, average education level, income level, like, you know, higher ability, all these metrics, right? And Rochester ranked number one mm. for like the potential to see the next tech boom, which there's no doubt in my mind. The mm. problem is, is that it's not just going to happen. You know, we were we were riding the photonics train for the last decade. You know, mm. and I was still, you know, at U of R. It was all photonics, photonics. But it's been almost ten years. Mm. You know, so I'm not. Sh I hope for the city's sake that that becomes a thing. But cannabis is going to be that thing. We have mm. the, you know, the University of Rochester Medical Center and mm. the Simon School of Business. We have RIT. We mm. have Cornell. Like we have three of the most powerful academic institutions within a hundred square miles who are chomping at the bit to get a piece of this. And with legalization right on around the corner, for us, it makes me bang my head against the against the wall. And we still have people from the city who rep, who are elected officials who can't come out and give it support. I was like, your duty to this city is to is to be the voice for people that don't have one and, and respectfully represent those people and by opposing this and not even i understand if you have questions i understand if you have concerns but do your damn research right mm -hmm. most of these questions and oppositional points that we're running on can be quickly debunked by a couple keystrokes in a google search bar mm -hmm. and it's well, just it depends on what you've been googling before because google knows what you want to see so it's it's no it's it's now biased unfortunately yeah. but i mean that is it it's like there's the resistance the fear um but it's dwarfed by the size of this industry. And, if, you know, when someone like Constellation Brands pours billions of dollars into a business that's literally across the lake from Rochester, like you can't doubt that it's all going to be coming back this way and making moves in this direction. Like the big players are moving. Um, and yeah, it's uh, it's a funny thing because you got to respect everyone's perspective. And it's it's more like those same back to like what's Hemp Lab doing? It's like, how do we ask the right questions to that group of individuals to help them open up? Because it's not about telling them anymore. Like they, they need to they need to be drawn out of their shell by knowing their voice is valuable and also that there's data that can offset and their fears. Yeah, I understand why your fear is embedded. Either your community was ravaged or you were told by Reefer Madness like what this plant is and, and our drug policies and all these things that have rippled past beyond that. It's like, yeah, it's going to take a lot to, to shake, to I guess maybe calm those nerves. Um, and definitely confrontation doesn't seem to be the answer. So it's like, yeah, how do we create a space for those voices to like be heard? And are they willing to hear the data that you're speaking to? Because the data does point to like crime rates don't go up. You know, roads seem to be as safe as they were, you know, like all it's, it's not like, you know, look at Denver. Denver hasn't burned down since legalization and quite fact, the opposite. Yeah, and it's like, maybe not because of cannabis solely, but we know that it can be, places can be functional. You know, there's absolutely concerns about underage consumption, you know, like, yeah, it's, it's, uh, you don't want to, there's a lot to consider there. Like, how do we make roads safer? This is a conversation we were having when we were down in Albany. It's like, Listen, with the past, whether you say yes or no, your community will have the opportunity to say no itself. If that's what your group wants to do, absolutely welcome. Power to you. But know that the issues you're concerned about, research, law enforcement, like there won't be funding to help push those solutions forward to actually make our communities a safer place um, unless this bill, you know, unless cannabis is passed. Because we see these, again, the biggest thing, and I agree, it's like, how do we make roads safer? You know, there's people already using cannabis on the roads. There's people already using opioids and prescription drugs on the road. And the process of testing is the same. That we're already, if we're short on, if we're scared about legalizing cannabis and being short on the ability to, you know, really monitor, then the problem is existing. We're already short on monitoring. And how are we going to get money to support, you know, the folks who keep our roads safe? Well, here's an opportunity. By saying no, we're shooting ourselves in a foot and allowing these problems to continue to perpetuate because they are there. And then we're, we don't have an answer to move forward. So it's just this like, okay, like how do we empower the no? Because yes, that's, you have your right, but also knowing that if we miss this boat, 
then we don't have access to the funding that's required to actually drive the solutions forward that you're asking for. And that's the thing. And maybe we're just, you know, we think differently because we are of the entrepreneurial mindset. But when I see have people, you know, like law enforcement who come to us and say, hey, we're concerned about road safety. And that's a concern. I don't think any of us are going to sit here and condone getting high and going out for a drive. OK, but I also am not going to condone, you know, improper, improper roadside testing or, or half-assed, half-thought-out testing because we don't have a solution and any solution is better than not. Well, it's not a better solution when people are wrongfully going to jail. Mm. And why don't, instead of we saying, hey, you know, this is prohibited, let's just keep it out of our streets, prohibition, prohibition, why don't we put on our entrepreneurial caps mm. and leverage all the institutional assets we have around here and we start finding some damn solutions because mm. whoever invented the breathalyzer is probably sitting pretty somewhere in a very, you know, sunny beach and mm. probably is getting residual income for the rest of their life. You know, that could happen here. And mm. I'm not saying that it's going to happen overnight, but we got to start thinking creatively. Mm. This city was built on strong business leaders. Mm. You know, Kodak, Bausch, and Xerox, in their prime, This was these were the three businesses that people look to. You have guys like Tom Galasano and Danny Wegman who have made a substantial impact in the city. And the next great thing to do that is going to be cannabis. So mm. it's like, we're, we're destined to be a successful city, building businesses, leveraging our resources. And I think finally we've had enough opportunities where the right people have been at the right table at the right time. Mm. Um, and not really, it's been done respectfully and amicably through the many conversations that both of our organizations have had. Mm -hmm. um, but really the matter is accountability. And I think that's kind of an overarching theme is transparent, transparency and accountability. But like, you and I both know what happens. Be you know the best we could get the best news from behind closed doors, but unless there's other people there, you know, in, on a public platform or whatever, to to push some accountability, mm. nothing get nothing happens. Which I think is why the Hemp Lab events have been so powerful, mm. because. You know, not, I'm not throwing any shade by any means. At, at Mike, Dr. Michael Mendoza, he does a great job at the public health commissioner. I have I have a lot of respect for him, but he's been generally leaned away from cannabis legalization, and rightfully rightfully so. He has a a, a very important job in terms of managing the sure. public health issues in Rochester. Yep. Um, but even him, as a as a general naysayer. Um, at the event, first thing he said was, I have become much more educated on this topic. Mm. And people are becoming woke and just being, you know, who is to say if we walked into his office with a bunch of pamphlets and data and he said, well, this sounds great. The next meeting he could say, I'm still not on board. Mm -hmm. When you put these people in, in a room full of other respectful individuals and you, you, you speak with them with respect and you provide an amicable platform, the results you get are amazing. Mm. But when you start pointing fingers and start reefer madness this and you know educate yourself that you're not going to get anywhere even mm -hmm. if you're right mm -hmm. so i think it's been kind of that balance of it's such a balancing act you know yeah I, I agree and something i want to say too is like i think that just pointing back to like cannabis will help rochester launch you know i strongly agree and i also feel like it's in conjunction with all these other great things that rochester has going for it and it's like we're on the teeter-totter of a cultural shift where people are beginning to move back here. Like one of the biggest issues for upstate New York is brain drain. And like, look at this industry. You know how many people have left Rochester to go find the cannabis industry elsewhere? You know, whether that be hemp, whether that be medical, whether that be recreational. Um, and so actually creating saying like, you know, that New York is open for business or it's open to creativity and entrepreneurship. Um, that's like, you know, we have a thriving microbrewery scene here. You know, we have a th thriving tech community. Uh, the education community is excessive and growing. And it's all these flavors that, again, go back to the MIT study. It's like there's the potential here. And we would benefit from saying yes here because this will create more entrepreneurs, more innovation, more businesses. Um, that, again, it's like we're not just talking about growing pot. Like we're talking about all the things that come into this. Like you again, you use the word supply chain, but all the businesses that support the cannabis industry. Like there's a saying out West. It's like, and everyone's heard it. It's like, uh, it's not the gold miners who made the money in the gold rush. It was the people who sold the picks and axes and the food and the jeans. And it's like, same goes for cannabis. You know, the, the price point of cannabis will drop out. You know, we'll see the specialty cultivators getting top dollar. Uh, we'll also see the wholesalers grow to meet that bottom line, to drive bottom line, to, steer out competition as well as you know the fact is there's there will be a flood at some point in time but it's all the businesses from quality control from heating and ventilation to security um you know it's lab who, testing lab testing um 
the you know the ace hardware is the heps of the world that yeah. are, are going to be selling the equipment and things like it takes so much to build the infrastructure at hand um and so it's it's we could talk for a whole hour at length as to like all the different business models that could be stemmed out of it but it's it's really an ecosystem of existing businesses you know ancillary businesses hands-on cultivators mm-hmm. all these things that come together to make an industry um that that's going to bring people from all different backgrounds who have a direct hand in the industry, an indirect hand, or hands in other places, but they're staying here because they have access to the market. Yeah, the cool thing is you don't have to reinvent the wheel and rebuild this whole you know brand new infrastructure because mm-hmm. everything already exists. Mm-hmm. You know, if you need heat, electric, plumbing, mm-hmm. there's companies out there yep. that sell heat, electric, and plumbing. Yeah, yep. you yep. know, there's a you know if you need you know there's tons of greenhouses and 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 um, you know grow operations here and horticulture and florists and all this stuff that doesn't look like cannabis on the outside, but when you start having the conversation, it becomes easily integratable. Mm-hmm. So it's like how can we you know lay out this, you know, what it looks like to, you know, as a company to have an ideal supply chain coupled with underlying principles of what we think would be the optimal company, because mm-hmm. you can make all the money that you want, but this is a full spectrum industry. You have to, you know, you have to discuss, you know, community reinvestment. It has, there has to be compliance. There has to be transparency. There has to be a focus on quality. Environmental, like Environment, sustainability. Yes, of it's course. Like, it's, and yeah. it's, it's something that, you know, I think the, there's a lot of big companies out there that are making a lot of money. Some will fail, some will grow, but what doesn't really exist right now is the brand. Mm. There, I think this industry will be one in brands because, like you said, eventually the industry is going to commoditize itself. You're going to be able to get whatever type of high quality cannabis you want mm. for a really low price and whatever form you want, and it's going to be great. It's and, going to be and great. And that's talking from seed to building material yes. to cannabinoids. Like it's extensive, and it's you know the, the some of the biggest insight is it's not about. You know, it might not be about cultivation, but how do you brand what you're doing? How do you get people like we're a brand culture? Our generation is all about who is your company, what is your company, who is your company, what is your company doing to serve and or create culture that is unique? Um, and that's going to be that's some strong advice that we've heard again and again. That's going to be a differentiator of like how can you create something that can stand or withstand or be bought out <laughs> because that's another survival tactic. Um, but yeah, it's definitely. Well, it's, I think, you know, of the brands, you know, I personally believe that a good brand is built on education and always mm-hmm. teaching and patient people are always learning. But the problem with this industry is there's no standardization. So what True. are we teaching? You know, mm-hmm. we can look to, you know, old Raphael Meshulam literature out of Hebrew University and some of the, the international studies, which are great, mm. right? But there isn't that standardization, those metrics, that data that we can start truly teaching and educating people on. So you have this whole world of, of domestic cannabis experts where there's a lot of people with big hearts and who have you know good intentions of educating but where are they getting their education? Are they mm-hmm. learning, you know, about cannab- cannabinoids and terpenes from a Leafly blog? You know, mm-hmm. we've all read them, mm-hmm. but like, where are you getting your information? So I think it's like, before we can talk about having that next big company, we have to set some, some ground rules, right? Mm-hmm. There has to be, you know, no one's really done that yet. No one's really put an effort into research. It's all, let's go to market, make a quick buck, you know, and we can look at, you know, everyone's done it right in their own way, but no one's really built the basement of the house, right? Mm. And that's going to be, you know, academic infrastructure and research. And the problem is, is that, you know, the federal funding issue. But Well, I think realistically, like, look to Canada because these massive corporations are in hand in hand with, you know, Canadian universities that have been looking at cannabis for 15 years, you know, 10 years, whatever. Um but I think, as you said, like there's no standardization. I think something I've heard again and again, especially coming out of like hearing this directly from the mouth of Canadian experts, is like we don't even know what we don't know yet. It's like we this this industry is going to take ten years before it standardizes, stabilizes. Um, that's from an economic perspective as well as a functional production perspective, quality control, et cetera. Um, and yeah, whether it's one brand or many brands, like, yeah, what are the best management practices for pest resistance and, and how to, to deal with the inevitable blights and issues that will come through that we're not even aware, we're not even aware they're there yet. Um, we know, you know, there's, there's a bunch of things we know about, but it's those things that once you scale up and whether that's making it, you know, higher volume in, in indoor grows or just production in general that it's going to be consumed by humans, like how do we find... It's going to take a long time for all that to mature, and um, 
yeah, what's what I hear again and again from industry leaders in New York is that how do we make New York a leader within that? And that's going to mean tighter regulations and higher standards, which will be harder probably for the average individual to follow um, because, you know, higher quality control means higher costs. Um, but it with the right education, with the right formatting, with the right support, anyone can have access to this industry. But if New York is going to be a leader, it's got a you know, it's got some big hurdles to step. Um, because as you said, they're currently it's kind of state to state, you know, city to city, uh, brand to brand. And that's what we keep saying is like we can talk about having the best industry in the entire world, but we have the bill and the laws have to allow it. You know, we're right now we're looking at with, you know, an excise tax of around 66 mm-hmm. percent coupled with the inability to get, you know, finance to get banking for the small businesses. Mm. How do you expect a business to thrive? How do you expect a business to not only get up and running, you know, because this industry is a freaking headache. You know, every aspect of this bin- business or this industry from marketing to merchant processing to everything in between is harder than it is to run a regular business, Mm -hmm. right? And how do you, you know, you get people in here with big ambitions and dreams and maybe one area of expertise in one area of the supply chain. Well, that's great. Are they going to know how to run a business, let alone a cannabis business and Mm -hmm. navigate this, this infinite amount of hurdles that you're going to face. And then if you do know how to manage the hurdles and you have the right team, are you going to have the money to pay the expense, expensive tax attorneys or the compliance attorneys? Or, or the accountant or the compliance. It's like the list goes on. And I think that's a big thing that uh, luckily, you know, you had Jason Klimek on the show from Boil and Code last, last week. And, you know, th- that level of insight of like, this is going to drown businesses and this is only set up to support large volume businesses. And I think actually getting that in the voices of legislatures, as well as business community, as well as stakeholders, so they can advocate for something that actually makes sense. As Jason said, it's like, New York is one to raise taxes, never to low taxes. So how do we start at a place that makes, again, the industry accessible to all walks of life, all size of business, but then we begin to develop a system to capitalize on that revenue um, in a sustainable way. Yeah. And I, I, for what, what we need to see in a bill, a lot of the things are going to be a very non New York thing to do, like starting with low taxes and creating a small business focused environment and, you know, not really allowing the big businesses to crush everybody. I think we're going to see that. Um, I think it, you know, the tone in Albany, uh, last week was interesting and you kind of got your first taste of lobbying. What did you, what was your overall experience? what did you feel about it? Um, I was blown away how accessible everything is. Like you think of Albany, you think of legislature assembly, assembly people or senators, you know, as something far, far away. And it's like, no, uh, we were able to knock on many doors and were welcomed in and, and our concerns and questions were heard as well as thanks was given for us being an educational resource. It's like how many folks were like, thank you, Rock Normal, for bringing all the data that you brought again and again that's helping us shape something that's going to be comprehensive and engaging and equitable across the board. Um, so I was really blown away but by the work that you all have you know, put down ahead of this, you know, leading up to this, um, as well as just the accessibility of like, okay, we can do this and we can ensure, you know, knowing who the folks are that are representing your cause or your voice or your region um, is just so crucial. And that, so I, I was blown away by, by that. Yeah. <laughs> Lobbying is so interesting because, you know, and to the legislators credit, um, whether the, you're you're a Democrat or Republican, I don't really care. They have a lot of things on their plate. So much, and, you know, to understand the complexities of this industry alone. I mean, how long have we both been studying it, and we're still barely scratching the surface? Mm-hmm. But to be able to expect a, a high level policymaker to understand is is it's unheard of. So they really appreciate when we show up and you know in our suit and ties and our little pop pins and our our pamphlets of information, and we talk to them because that's how lobbying should be, mm. right? There's no well, it's educating. You know, it's, it's educating. Like, yeah. it's, there's there's nothing besides education. Can we make informed decisions? Back to this whole base. Why hemp lab? Why cannabis? This we all need to be talking about it because if we're not, then it's we're not crafting something that's holistic. You know, as you said, it's not a full spectrum thing if we're looking at just a fraction of it or just half of the people are looking at it. So um, I think that's it's that's definitely apparent. Yeah, we'll see. We're heading down to Albany again tomorrow or Wednesday morning. Mm-hmm. So in, in response to our Albany 
lobby day last week smart approaches to marijuana has uh created their own lobby day tomorrow which will we will be going down with drug policy alliance and the start smart coalition and the oh um new york state cannabis processors and growers association yep yeah we're going down there with an army yeah um it's gonna i think it's just frustrating to like you have this entire state that's that's come together with facts and research and and experts across, of all walks of life that really have found their niche in this industry. And even with facts, you have a com- you know you have organizations like SAM that are very well funded and undereducated and clearly pushing a very misconstrued lie for purposes unbeknownst to me or the rest of us. I think we you know not to play conspiracy theorists, but we can probably all assume why this is happening and. You know, it's. I think that generally, when we're it up sounds like another hour of conversation. Conversation. Yeah, we won't <laughs> get into that, but it's. I the grassroots. This is a very. You know, I have never done any political lobbying beyond the cannabis industry, and my eyes have really been open to what it entails and how this process actually works. And you can see how having a lot of money and a lot of you know financial backing could make a process like this very easy, because while we have to make you know send a hundred emails maybe to get a response to then set up a meeting and then we have to drive there and we have to stay overnight and we provide all these materials. That's, you know, for most people would be very difficult. We're mm-hmm. lucky that we, our schedules and lives can accommodate that. But if you're a billion dollar, you know, organization or a well-funded, you're paying, you know, you're writing a, a donation right to the, to the head cheese and you're going to get in front of the policymakers. Mm-hmm. So it's like, but grassroots activism, I've noticed and I've heard a lot from from our connections in the House and uh, in the Senate and the Assembly that the, the legislators are really looking to the grassroots activists, you know, mm-hmm. not the suitors that are coming in there like Sam that are lobbying against us. So I think we're going to see a win mm-hmm. um, on the 20th. I really do. Um, we're going to see another revision of that bill this week. Um, but before we wrap it up, where is Hemp Lab in five years? Wow. Dream. <laughs> Uh, definitely a hempcrete building built by my friend Maddie Mead, uh, with <laughs> cultivation and an entire seed to sale platform in house, uh, co working space, business incubator, uh, grant funder or grant, you know, recipient and distributor, um, to help make Rochester great on all sides of the tracks. Um, yeah, really trying to be there to support. Uh, at that point in time, I think, uh, yeah, it'll it'll be well on its way to fulfilling its mission of, of helping drive economic development and community development as well. I'm going to have to send you my application after we wrap it up. You got it. Well, thank you again so much for coming on. I was really excited about this episode. I always walk away from our conversations with my wheels turning and just kind of a, another new appreciation for the industry. And for that, I thank you. Rock Normal, thanks you. You're the man. Mm, thanks, um, Steve. Thank you, Rock Normal. Yeah. And that wraps up episode four of Rock Normal. Thanks again to Zach Sarkis, founder and executive director of New York Hemp Lab. And we are out. Rock Normal.